we always hear from like the political consultants and the pollsters, well, nobody wants to hear about taxes. I think Jerry Brown said this recently. He's like, well, if you talk about raising revenue, you're going to lose statewide. All right. So it sounds like you don't agree with that. I don't. Um, I, I think when you, I think you have to have the courage of your convictions about certain things. Um, and part of my disappointment in um, what's been going on in Sacramento is that no one seems to have courage of their convictions. It's like the Republicans get to stand on their core values and not budge. Right. And the Democrats are, you know, begin negotiating away things that, that matter to us, um, like services, uh, you know, for the poor, like education. I mean, just all these issues, like things for people with disability. I, I mean, we have core values too, and, and it's been disappointing. I'll tell you an interesting thing that I did um, last year in Los Angeles, and it was controversial, and it ended up not winning, but the amount that it lost by was so significant that I'll tell you the story. I believe that we have to spend more money on preventing kids from joining gangs in the first place. But we're never going to end gang violence um, in Los Angeles or in the state unless we start really investing in after school programs, job training, mentoring, tutoring, keeping kids from joining gangs, because by the way, the gangs are really good at recruiting, and we need to figure out how to out-recruit the gangs. And all you really need to do is offer a little something after school, a little after school job, a little money in your pocket. Uh, that's what the gangs are doing, and these kids are hooked. I put on the ballot last year in, in Los Angeles a parcel tax. Okay, that's a flat tax. Many would say it's a regressive tax. Uh, you know, that everybody pays the same, why aren't you charging certain people more and the poor people less. Uh, it was a $3 a month a parcel tax to, that would raise $30 million to fund all these things I just talked about in perpetuity right. forever. In 10 years, we'd have $300 million just on after school job training. Um, it needed 66.67. It received 66.28. <laughs> but it told me that people were willing to tax themselves a property tax if they knew that it was going for something they believed in. And the polling showed that most people believe in what I just said. They like police officers. They, they want you know, more cops. But if we don't couple that with real prevention, it's, we're not going to solve the problem. And I even had people say, well, why should, you know, why should the, the poor people pay the same amount of money? You know where it got the highest support? In South Central Los Angeles. The highest support. These mothers were willing to pay $3 a month because they knew that that is exactly what their kids needed. Right. Their kids needed that kind of investment in their lives because they were being bombarded every day by gang members. So I think if you do it right, I think if you have courage of your convictions um, and you sell it the proper way, Californians, Californians believe in certain things. And I think they believe that you have to be able to pay for them. Now, would you be a statewide voice to make that case, should you be lieutenant governor? I would. I would. Um, you know, um, and uh, that and a lot of other things. Uh, again, and there's, is there any better way to bring revenue to the state uh, except for stimulating the economy with jobs and job creations? So I, I think coupled with more ideas to increase revenue uh, is, is the only way we're going to be great again. Interesting. Um, I want to go back real quick to something you mentioned about the uh, UC Regents, and uh, there's a vote coming up very soon about this 30% fee increase. Um, if you were on that board next week, how would you vote on that? I would vote no. I would vote absolutely no. Not only does it um, begin to put it out of reach for many of our students, but I, I've talked to some of them that said, well, it's it's not completely out of reach, but now we can only take so many units, you know, per semester, and now it lengthens the time that we have to stay to get our education, which again prolongs us eventually um, getting our degrees and going on to, you know, actually get a good job and a career. So it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Um, and I, again, I think the saving grace for California is going to be education. And not just higher education. I'm one of those that wants to do the vocational training back in the high schools. You know, the 
auto body shops, the, the wood shops, the home economics, the, you know, the upholstery classes. I met somebody who uh, took upholstery in high school and now, and he went on to establish a very successful upholstery business. We have cut out all that stuff, band, music, art, drama. And by the way, not every high school kid will go on to college, and that's okay. Right. But what's happening now is they're dropping out because there's nothing to keep them in high school. Uh, and many kids we know only work hard on their homework because they have a chance at being in the drill team or the being in the after school play. Or, and that's okay. You know, we've got to find out what works for a lot of our kids. It's not a one size fits all approach. It's not. And uh, again, I want to work with um, our wonderful union friends in bringing back good apprenticeship programs. Yes. And that takes funding. And, and this proposition that I had in the ballot would have helped to fund more apprenticeship programs. That's the way you do it. You get these uh, young people hooked up with one of the great uh, building trades or crafts, working right alongside uh, these folks, and they end up having a good paying career. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Very good. You got a question? Um, well, I did have a, a one more, which is about the um, the Coastal Commission. Yeah. Which um, it's been around for what about thirty years now? Thirty five yeah. years. Thirty five. Um, how do you envision sort of the the role of the, the, I mean, not only with oil drilling, but with um, gentrification of some of those houses that are there, and the ex expansion of properties on the coast, of development, and how how can we not just sort of reflexively, you know, block development? but work to prevent, you know, sort of right. create a sustainable development. Right. Um, well, you know, uh, again, I, I think I, my record and my family's record has always been about being for the people. You know, be, being for, uh, I remember my dad having a fight when he was County Board of Supervisors with those who wanted to build uh, in Malibu, you know, and blocking access to the, to the beach for, you know, average folks. And he just went, you know, this is not your, this is not your beach, this is not your, your coast, this belongs to everybody. And I think that's the challenge, is to continue to remember uh, that uh, access to the water is, is everybody's right. Uh, but, I, I, but again, I mean, I think if we allow development, by the way, the Tuna Governor doesn't sit on the Coastal Commission. Oh. They sit on the Ocean Protection Oh, see, no, I, see. Uh, yeah. So but, many commissions, yeah, but, but, I, I, but I, I still, nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, I think they're very, they have very similar, yeah. um, goals and missions and, frankly, obligations. Mm -hmm. Obligations to keep this coast um, for the people. And if there is development, I, I agree. I think it, it has to be uh, sustainable. I, I think it can't harm our environment. Um, and I think our, our, our coast is our greatest asset, our greatest asset in California. Uh, that's where I think we have to figure out how to you know, keep that as um, viable and um, protected as possible. So about this Ocean Protection Commission, um, I live in Monterey, and we have a lot of fishermen, yeah. and they're very upset with the water debate because their voices aren't being heard, and it's basically a debate about how do we transfer a bunch of water to uh, some very well-connected, wealthy people who were last in line for the water. Anyway, the people I talk to on Fisherman's Wharf uh, are livid about this. They say no one's protecting their interests. I mean, how would you as lieutenant governor not just deal with water issues, but further promote you know, sustainable fisheries and, and good protection of, of, of the uh, ocean resources. Right, I think that's, um, that's the balance. That's the balance. I mean, I can't, we can't say you know, we can have the fishing industry or we can have protective waters. Uh, it's sort of like I've done down in the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, people say, oh, you can only have good jobs, you can't have clean air. No, you can have both. You can have clean air and you can have good jobs. And that's a debate we shouldn't keep getting in because the technology exists today to have uh, the goods, international goods movement and have clean air. And I, I feel very close to the fishing industry. Um, I live in San Pedro. San Pedro was founded uh, from people who came from the old country, both in Croatia and Italy, and they came to San Pedro for the fishing. And we have longtime families that have been in that. And they sort of feel the same way. Um, wait a minute, who's, who's looking out after our interests, and again, by the way, it's jobs. And the jobs that come from the fishing industry, you know, are, it's the multiplier factor. 
and it's very significant. What I think would be interesting for the Lieutenant Governor, which I would like to do, is connect the Ocean Protection Council with the Economic Development Commission. And, you know, it's not one or the other. Let's look at um, how we can make sure the economy of the fishing industry remains viable and, and, and important, frankly. I think it's important um, while we um, continue to look at protecting um, the ocean. It's a balance. It's a compromise. I've been known for bringing people in the same room who are, who are complete opposites and coming out with something that works for everybody. Um, I think women are better at that sometimes. <laughs> Could well be. We've had, God, how many male governors in a row now since the beginning? And a lot. States in crisis. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want to say that. I'm glad you did. You know, I, I would be the first woman lieutenant governor that our state has ever had. And um, I do think women govern differently. I think we look at things differently. We come to conclusions differently. And I do think we um, do have a, a, a skill set that is about um, kind of trying to find a solution um, without all the fighting. Cool. And we run the homes at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about uh, Lieutenant Governor position, um, and I want to get into this issue of state reform and how we fix what's broken in the state. Um, there have been some people talking about a constitutional convention, and I want you to weigh in on that concept. But one thing that I've heard, you know, I've been in some of these town halls on the Constitutional Convention, people say, well, one thing we can do is abolish the lieutenant governor's office. Right. Um, just get rid of it, it doesn't do anything. Right. Um, you know, how would you respond to this, someone seeking that office? I mean, how, how would you justify the office that you were looking to hold? Well, you know, um, again, currently under our Constitution, I think it's a great job in itself. I think part of the perception has maybe been those who have held this job, and uh, they always seem to be sort of looking you know, uh, uh, at the governor's office, uh, the joke about you wake up every morning to see whether or not the governor's alive, and uh, <laughs> if he is, you go back to bed. You know, I, that's sort of the, this joke uh, that I think people actually believe. Uh, but when I began looking at it, I thought this is actually a really good job, and it's a job that could be um, among all the constitutional, you know, obligations that it has. It really is a voice, I mean, and it's a very strong voice. You're really you know, second in the state um, on, you know, a number of issues. And I think you use it um, in a way that, you know, it can be powerful, which I intend to do. Don't think they would say that if they'd seen me as lieutenant governor. And I'm, I'm like that, I, whether it's a city council job or kind of everything I've ever done, I've looked at it and expanded it and made it my own. And, uh, I, I, I think it's a I think it's a good job and it, and it um, it serves a purpose. So about this notion of a constitutional convention, I want to talk a little bit about fixing the state. I mean, at Caltech we write off, and I certainly written off, in this notion that the state is broken. I think state government is broken, and you know, for a lot of people, California looks like a failed state. The California dream seems quite dead. Um, I personally think it is dead, but could be revived. Um, and part of that is figure out what about our government we need to fix and change. Um, and a lot of people float this constitutional convention idea as one opportunity to get at that. Where, where do you stand on that? Yeah, I, actually, the first job I was ever elected to was the Charter Reform Commission in the city of Los Angeles in 1997. And we hadn't looked at our city charter for 75 years. Right. So we spent two years. Uh, we were, there was 15 of us that were elected. Uh, and then the mayor and the city council appointed another commission because they were very nervous about what we would actually do. And uh, it was interesting. It was, it was a great time for Los Angeles to have this great civic debate on where we kind of wanted to go mm -hmm. in the future. And, and we, uh, out of our city charter, we created neighborhood councils and we created area planning commissions instead of one downtown commission. We made the, more actu the mayor actually more accountable. And so uh, we, we did some things that were interesting. I'm a little nervous about the state Constitutional Convention. Um, I'm a little nervous about um, how it gets formed, the people that actually sit on that, uh, and whether or not they would truly reflect uh, the diversity of this great state. Um, I'm a little unclear on how uh, things would actually get decided or voted on or, um, you know, 
is this going to be brown active? And you know, I, I'm a little nervous about deals being cut um, that would benefit the few and not the many. So I'm not sold on the Constitution, Constitutional Convention. Um, I am sold on trying to get rid of the two-thirds uh, vote for, for anything that has to do with our budget. I, I think that's well, what, one of three states that still does that. We can see what happened. We can see what happened. It's a disaster. I think the majority uh, should make the decisions on budget decisions in the state. Do you think that's true for revenue as well, given that you have this parcel tax, which you know should have passed? Uh, it yes. got 66, uh, it's well, a landslide victory. I know, it was, a, I, thank you. I said that if anybody else had gotten that, it's a landslide. 66.28, yeah. man, every politician would love to get that. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was a landslide, it was a mandate, it was an overwhelming. Uh, one of the things I, I've been hearing is uh, giving it back to local municipalities to make that choice for themselves. So maybe, uh, you know, one city would rather keep it at a certain level, maybe Los Angeles would like to do it a 55, you know, we did the school bonds, we brought down to 55%. Right. So maybe you give that to a local uh, municipality to decide, but I think you've got to give us also the opportunity locally to be able to raise revenue. Um, so I'm in favor of uh, looking at, at that as well. Why should, why should people who are against things have two votes? And when you're four, you only have one vote. It just seems wrong on a lot of levels. So I, we actually, I think Brian and I both share the nervousness and concern about the Constitutional Convention and what Absolutely. we'll talk a little bit more later about how that came to be. Um, what else do you, would you envision as part of an effort to you know, revive the effectiveness and confidence in, in our state's government? I mean, as Lieutenant Governor, I think you would be in a position to be able to offer um, something that's not just, well, we don't like this, we don't like this, but this is how we can you know, address the, the very serious problems with how the state is governed. Yeah, what did you say, local government? Yeah, you know, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the uh, ideas I like is local government protection. And I know the League of Cities um, is putting forward an initiative um, that says, hey, we're not trying to take money that's not ours, but the money that's coming to us locally, yeah. we should be able to keep that. And that should not really be part of the scenario that is um, able to be used to balance the state budget. Um, as a city councilwoman in Los Angeles, you know, second largest city in the country, uh, six, seven billion dollar budget, we balance that very fragilely, right? We negotiate with our unions, we cut, we, you know, we, we, we got a balanced budget, only to have the state come in and take 120 million and threaten to take another 66 million in our gas tax. Okay, you can't run a city like that. And the cities are the one, we're the ones that deliver the police. We deliver the fire services. We deliver sanitation. We deliver, you know, libraries, parks. I mean, that's what local government does best. Right. We're good at it. I don't really want the state telling me that now I'm going to have to close some of my fire stations on a rotating basis um, during fire season. Uh, you know, that doesn't, that's, doesn't feel good to me. And I, I think that could completely change the way this state is run. And I will tell you, every council member and mayor in this great state feels the exact same way. We want to be able to um, run our cities the way we see fit. And by the way, this state is great because of every county, every city, every neighborhood, every community. That's what makes the state great. And we kind of need to get great from the bottom up. And California's not going to recover if every neighborhood is not recovering and every family doesn't recover. And, you know, and that's how it's going to work. It's got to be from the ground up, not from the top down, in my opinion. Great. Um, I've got a couple more, but I want to give you a wow. chance. Okay, well, we got to get her down at yeah. 12.30. So. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Just two, so much fun. <laughs> two, two <laughs> so far, don't run questions. it. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Two quick things. Um, I look at your Twitter feed right here, and just uh, two of the most recent things. Oh. Uh, you just signed a petition at 4billion.com in support of the full $4 billion in federal funding for high-speed rail. Yes. And attended high-speed rail press conference today. We hope to get $4.5 in federal stimulus funds for the project. I'm a huge supporter of high-speed oh, rail. Oh, good. And one thing we lack is a statewide advocate for that yes. project. Yes. We have, I love it. you I know, love it. a lot of people in 
parts of the state who are a little uncomfortable how it might get implemented, and then there's the usual fiscal scolds who are like, well, we just can't spend that money. Right. Would you be interested yes. in being a statewide advocate? I would be. I absolutely would be, which is why I showed up at the press conference, and which is why I uh, have been advocating it. Uh, I absolutely think we need that in California for so many reasons. One, for moving people. Uh, the other thing we haven't talked about is tourism, which is a, a huge part of the new economy. Tourism has surpassed goods movement uh, as, the, as the number one industry in, in uh, the LA region. Uh, how many people do we know that travel to Japan or Germany to do what? Ride the high-speed rail. Yeah. So besides being the smart way for transportation in California, it actually might bring some folks to our state who uh, you know just want to, want to ride it. And I think tourism is also key to uh, the new economy. Yeah. We've got to bring people back to California. It's a great place to come, not just for a football game. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to be the champion for okay. high-speed rail as lieutenant governor. Very I, cool. I think it would be a great uh, uh, position for me. Good. And you know, I coming from Monterey, right? We survive on tourism, right? The tourists keep yes. our libraries open and Absolutely. our schools funded. Absolutely. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we need to look at that in California as, as a huge boost to our economy. So the last thing is, uh, you know, as I've been writing and looking at California and talking about, you know, what's broken, what's gone wrong, you know, we've been functioning over the last 30 years with this model that we have to have low, tax, low taxes and, you know, we'll use a subsidized sprawl and everyone's going to live all over the place and, you know, we'll just basically starve local government. No one offers a vision for the next 30 years of what the state will look like. And, Maybe, maybe this is just me, but it seems that one thing Democrats should be doing is offering that vision of what the next 30 years in California ought to be able to look like. What is your vision for the next 30 years in California? Janice Hahn is Lieutenant Governor. Your little piece of <laughs> showing us what the next generation of California would be. I mean, and that's a big question. That's Feel free to pick off a piece of that. But That is a big question. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, I am kind of of another generation than you boys. <laughs> um, but I think people are, are um, looking at Jerry Brown and Janice Hahn in a kind of an interesting way. It's sort of like the Hans and the Browns together again. Uh, you know, Pat Brown was, was uh, one of the great governors that uh, had a vision for um, our university system, mm -hmm. our uh, roads and highways and infrastructure, uh, and Kenny Hahn. Uh, was this guy who was way ahead of his time and built call boxes and right. started paramedics and uh, built hospitals. Uh, actually, it's kind of an interesting scenario. Uh, we, Jerry and I, both come from these families that actually believed in uh, really looking at the future of California. And I think, again, I take it from, um, I went to Obama's inauguration and, and sat there in the cold and heard him say, America, you know, We've got to pick ourselves up. We've got to dust ourselves off. We've got to reinvent ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we've got to sort of start over, but we have to remember what made America great. And for me, we need to remember what made California great. Why did people come here? And it really was that promise. It was that hope. Uh, but then we put people to work, building the infrastructure. Uh, we thought education was important enough to create a whole university system. So my vision for the next 30 years is we uh, get back to things like building the high-speed rail. That's a great project. That will put a lot of people to work, and that will be part of our future. Um, I, I want to get back to making education um, something that we're proud of. Uh, and uh, I want to um, take what is so natural for California, and that's, you know, green technology and make that sort of uh, the next next 30 years that we begin to um, invest in uh, th that kind of technology uh, that will clean up the environment, that will allow us to have you know, ports that thrive but don't pollute, pollute the air. Uh, we have 2,400 premature deaths in California by cargo-related pollution. So my vision is, let's have it all. Let's have it all in the next 30 years. Let's build our economy, let's clean our air, let's protect our oceans, and let's raise up a generation of young people that will not join a gang, but will be, have been given an opportunity uh, to be a part of uh, the greatness that California can be. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Yes. And uh, it, that was fantastic. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. And before, you know, I, I, I like to end it on a less serious note. Thank so you. I'm going <laughs> to, what, what's your favorite movie? Oh, my God. My favorite movie? Your fa- well, or, or an interesting fact about yourself that people wouldn't necessarily know about if somebody asked, what is, what is. Here's something that people would not know about me. I was athlete of the year in my senior year in high school. Wow. What See? sports? I played basketball. Volleyball, softball, and I ran track. Wow! And she wasn't. No. She wasn't the female athlete of the year. She was. I was the, the athlete. athlete of the year. Thank you for. <laughs> wow! So no one knows that about me. That is really interesting. Thank you. We'll talk about, my, we'll talk about my movies yes. next time. <laughs> well, thank thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I really yes. loved being interviewed by you guys. Good. Thank you. Thank you.